So I, today I'd like to talk about um, a circuit model that we think uh, helps um, understand the general behavior of perovskite solar cells. Um, the, the model is, uh, I suppose, what one would describe as a large perturbation model. So normally when one thinks about circuit models, one thinks about, uh, or very often, when one thinks about circuit models or equivalent circuit models to describe a system, one thinks about uh, something that just contains li linear circuit elements. So uh, resistors and capacitors, for example. Um, this is a circuit model that can be linearized. And I think you'll hear about that kind of, th that kind of thing later on in the conference. Uh, but it's also a model that works in um, a nonlinear sense because it contains nonlinear circuit elements. But you can take it in any small regime and uh, derive the linear equivalent behavior. So I'm going to, I'll, I'll step on. Um, as I think uh, you, you've, you've heard, uh, perovskite solar cells often display a, a strange and weird, and wonderful transient behavior such that you don't necessarily get a single steady state behavior. And uh, there are all sorts of transient measurements that one can make on solar cells to try and understand their, their kinetics and, and the uh, rates of recombination and maybe try and pinpoint where recombination is happening if it's, uh, if it's happening in, in interfaces or in the bulk, and you might be able to figure out uh, if there is uh, accumulated charge in, in traps in the material or um, whether everything is behaving as you expect. And so one might hit a device with a pulse of light, or you might perturb it with a, a change in voltage, and you might watch the response in terms of the current or the um, or the voltage to, to one of these perturbations. And by looking at the time constant of the relaxation, you might then build up a picture of the kinetics going on in the cell. And um, what we found is that these measurements typically are, are very complicated to understand in perovskite solar cells, and we can't apply the, the usual rules that we would. Um, so what I thought I'd do is start with the, the, the most basic model uh, that's normally used to describe a solar cell. And that's uh, the diode model, or at least I think it's probably the most uh, simple model that would describe the system. And this is just a representation of a PN diode. So we've got a P-type semiconductor in the shaded pink on the left, and we've got a um, N-type on the right. And uh, this is a picture or an image of a band diagram of a PN di diode. And in this case, it's a Homer junction. So we've got the P-type material on the left and the, uh, and I wonder, I'm just going to turn on my pointer. Uh, okay, there we are. So we've got the P-type on, uh, on the left, N-type on the right here. And, um, we have an exchange current between those at equilibrium. So there'll be a certain fraction of electrons that have sufficient energy to overcome this energetic barrier. And uh, we could represent those uh, using this sort of representation of the, in pink here of a Boltzmann distribution. So this fraction of electrons up here has enough, uh, have enough energy to overcome the energetic barrier. And there are, the, this fraction of the Boltzmann, Boltzmann distribution on the left-hand side has enough energy uh, to, to exist in the, in the uh, conduction band of the p-type material. And so there's an equal and opposite exchange of electrons diffusing or uh, jumping in either direction across that interface. Now, if we were to apply a positive voltage, and you'll note the positive here uh, is in the downward direction, um, we then get a splitting of the quasi-Fermi levels of our device. So our n-type quasi-Fermi level is up here at zero volts at our reference position, and our p-type uh, quasi-Fermi level, so that's the quasi-Fermi level of our holes, if you like, uh, is down here. 
now if we look at our Fermi uh, our Boltzmann distributions, we suddenly have a much larger fraction of electrons which are able to jump across the interface relative to the fraction of holes which has remained the same in the, in the um, conduction band of the p-type. And so now we're going to have a net current flowing from right to left. So the, the current flowing in that direction will be much smaller than the current flowing in, in the opposite direction. And of course, that's going to be this, this process because the concentration changes that, 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 that has sufficient energy to cross the interface is changing exponent, exponentially with the applied voltage. We can describe that using the diode equation. So this is, this is just a, uh, a representation of how the current density J is going to depend on the applied voltage. And I imagine many of you will be familiar with the diode equation. And of course, the diode equation leads to an exponential looking current voltage curve. So, and uh, the picture is more or less the same if we were to put an intrinsic material and in, in between a p-type and an n-type. And that's more or less what we think we have with a uh, perovskite semiconductor. Although the perovskite may be slightly n-type or p-type relative to the concentrations of holes in the hole transporting layer and electrons in the um, electron transporting layer, both of which are, are relatively heavily doped under most circumstances, perhaps not with PCA, PCBM, it, it depends on the, on the situation. Uh, we have something to which to a first approximation is uh, we can consider to be like an intrinsic material sandwich between them. And so we get a current voltage curve that looks something like that. And if we were to turn on the light, the di our, our diode equation of the solar cell just uh, subtracts a, a constant photogeneration current and that shifts the whole curve downwards, as we can see there. So if we were to take the gradient of this current voltage curve at any point along it, we could, we could determine the conductance and of course, one over the conductance would give us the resistance or the recombination resistance at any point along the current along the curve. And so in the small perturbation limit, that would be like a, a linear resistor. So if we just made a small change in the voltage, we get a small change in the current and the slope, uh, of course, would be uh, what, we've, what we've just measured in our current voltage curve, one over the slope for the resistance. And we could differentiate, um, as, as described here, we could differentiate our current voltage curve and we would get the resistance at any point. And of course the resistance, it follows then that the resistance is proportional to one over the current going through the device. Okay, so, so here, this is our, our picture of a, a PIN device. In this case, I haven't bought, I, in my diagram, I haven't changed the band gaps of all the different components. Of course, for perovskite solar cells, very often we observe something that doesn't seem to be well described by the diode equation. And we see all sorts of strange behavior. And this is a classic example when we, when we scan from a high forward bias back towards a um, a lower bias, we observe what appears to be a higher efficiency device than if we scan from a low voltage to a high voltage. So our, our, our simple model here doesn't seem to be sufficient to describe what's going on. And of course, one of the first papers uh, to, to um, recognize or, or to, to uh, put into the public domain um, this phenomena was the paper by Snaith back in 2014. And they showed that if you wait long enough, you can still get a high efficiency if you sit uh, at a voltage close to the maximum power point. Eventually the current stabilizes. And uh, so a, a significant question is how can we, how can we describe this, this process in the simplest way possible, which still encapsulates the key um, key underlying uh, 
physics of the situation. And we know that even in devices that appear to be more or less free of hysteresis, generally speaking, they will show it. So here's an example where we've, we've taken a device that looks like it's hysteresis free, but if you cool it down, suddenly you see a very uh, significant amount of hysteresis. And there's a general consensus, I wouldn't say it's absolutely 100%, that the underlying reason for this hysteresis is something to do with the presence of uh, ionic charge uh, defects. So, so um, high concentration of ionic charge in the device. And people have suggested, um, for example, Aaron Walsh, that the spontaneously generated concentration of, of uh, ionic defects in these devices is could be as much as about 0.4% of uh, by, uh, atomic fraction um, within the device, which is really quite a high concentration. And that puts us up in the, the region of about 10 to the 19 per centimeter cubed. And this is a much, much higher concentration than the doping levels that we, or, or the electronic concentrations that we see in a typical uh, perovskite layer. So what would we expect that to do if we had lots of, lots of charge defects? Well, um, if we take a, a picture of a, um, a PIN device or even an intrinsic layer sandwiched between two uh, electrodes of different work functions, we'd expect there then to be a built-in potential, which is related to the difference in uh, energy of the two electrodes, difference in work function of the two electrodes, and that would lead to an accumulation of ionic defects on one side, which would begin to uh, screen the electric field in the device. And if the concentration of ionic defects is sufficiently high, then we'd expect that, that, um, that those defects would move to entirely screen the uh, gradient in the potential. And of course, the gradient in the potential equals the uh, is equal to the electric field, um, and we'd expect that the electric field to eventually go completely flat. And we see a kind of response time on the order of seconds, let's say. It depends on the particular device, and we'll see, we'll see why that is a bit later. And what, what people have also seen is that it seems like the interfaces on your device are key to determining whether or not you observe hysteresis. And we see if we change an otherwise identical device, uh, and these two are not otherwise identical, but the perovskite layers were, we did con some control experiments where we saw it was the case. Um, we, we see significant hysteresis or very little hysteresis depending on the choice of interfaces. And one can turn, and in simulations, one can turn on and off, which include mobile lines which shuttle around. Um, one can uh, turn on and off that um, hysteresis simply by turning on and off the interfacial recombination, for example. And we'll see why that's uh, significant when we go back to thinking about a, surface mod uh, a, a, a circuit model. So here's our, here's our circuit model of a PIN diode, where let's assume that the key recombination is occurring at one of the interfaces. And again, we think interfacial recombination is generally the dominant recombination mechanism in perovskite solar cells. So how can we modify our, our circuit model to include ions? So let's say we've got our two interfacial layers and we've got a perovskite in between. So we then have a space charge layer here. So in, in these pictures, my convention is squares Squares represent uh, ionic charges. So in, in the HTM and the ETM, those represent dopant atoms, and the circles represent electronic charges. So we've got a region of unscreened, uh, unscreened ionic charge here and here. So those, and those are immobile dopants. Then we have a load of mobile dopants 
in, in our perovskite. And I'm just showing the unscreened dopants now, or mobile ions, and they shift to the interfaces to screen, or we believe that they, they screen the uh, surface layers. So we've got layers of space charge in our, in our device. And we could think of that as being like a big old capacitor. And if we were to modulate the voltage at very high frequencies, our ions would have very little chance to move in response to those high frequency voltage perturbations. And so only the electron, and, and because we've got more or less something close to an intrinsic material in the middle, we've only got electronic charge in the contacts. So that's going to shuttle backwards and forwards. And um, so we have something that appears to look like a capacitor um, where the capacitor plates are given uh, are somewhere in the contact material. If we th were then to modulate the voltage at a low frequency, so omega representing the angular frequency, then we would expect the ions to have a chance to shuttle backwards and forwards. And we could represent the ionic motion as impeded by some ionic resistance. So that would be given by our ionic mobility. And we could describe the uh, we could describe the system as in a way akin to a lossy dielectric, which has a high frequency component and a, a static component. And then there might be a time constant related to the time with which the ions uh, shuttle backwards and forwards. And that time constant might be similar to the um, RC time constant corresponding to the capacitive capacitor at each interface. So effectively, we've now got two capacitors in series. And when we put two capacitors in series, the total capacitance is would be C iron over two. So C iron just re represents the interfacial capacitance when we include ions in our circuit um, or of an interface. And I'm assuming here that the two sides are the same for simplicity. And that would, uh, and that would give us a, a description of the ionic impedance uh, plugged into the, the previous expression that looks something like this. Sorry, I jumped across, but um, we've, got, we've got to keep moving on. Okay, so we could then put our, our description of the of the ion of the the ionic branch, if you like, which at high frequencies just looks like a geometric capacitor, where we ignore this central component, but at low frequencies, look looks like two capacitors in series, but with a large ionic resistor in between. Okay, and we could use a technique such as impedance spectroscopy to, to, uh, to test that kind, of a, um, that kind of a situation. Oh, okay, I've got, sorry, I, I, I seem to have some repeated slides here for which I apologize. Not quite sure why that was repeating. Okay, so here's my, here's my very quick whistle stop, stop description of impedance spectroscopy. We're going to modulate the voltage up and down, and we could do that at lots of different frequencies. And we can look at the response of the system, um, current that comes from the system, and look at the phase shift between the current and the amplitude. And by taking the current, the voltage over the current, we're going to get an impedance, and we can modify that by the phase shift. And we could do that at lots of different frequencies to get the impedance as a, fun as a function of uh, the frequency. And we could split our impedance into a real and an imaginary part if we, if we represent it using this exponential term. And in this complex space, we can describe the real part of the, the or the real part of the impedance of a resistor is just, or the, the impedance of a resistor is just the resistance, but a capacitor, the impedance is given by one over I omega C. And if we plot 
the apparent capacitive component of the impedance as a function of frequency, we see something that looks like this for a perovskite device. So this is our circuit model that looks like that. And okay, it's not perfect, but we've got something that's broadly speaking uh, described by our circuit model. So here we've got the geometric capacitance at high frequencies where the ions can't move. And we've got the, the uh, low frequency uh, behavior, which is giving us the, 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 the interfacial capacitances. So what happens if we then turn on light? What we see is we start to get very, very high we start to get very, very high apparent capacitances in the, in the light, um, particularly at low frequencies. And these turn out to be much, much higher than you could expect in any physically uh, meaningful interpretation of accumulation of charge. We're getting, uh, you know, tens of millifarads per centimeter squared, which is an absolutely massive value. So our picture of the, the diode isn't sufficient. Now we, we simulated uh, this behavior in a drift diffusion model, and I'm not going to talk about uh, drift diffusion models very much here, other than to say, if you'd like to have a look at the, the code we've got, um, we've, we've developed an open source code that can run on MATLAB. You can take any number of semiconductor layers and you can put ions into them if you want and uh, uh, simulate the behavior of devices. And uh, that's freely available on, on GitHub if you'd like it. So when we simulated our device, and this is just a simple example, what we observed is if we take a high frequency case, so the angular frequency is much greater than the time constant of our capacitors, uh, our, inter our ionic interfacial capacitors, what we observe is the out of phase component of the electronic current uh, is exactly the same as the amount of electronic charge that's cum accumulating at the interfaces, which is, I suppose, what we would expect. If we, if we simulate at low frequencies, what we observe is that the out of phase electronic current is not the same as the electronic ac current accumulating at the interfaces. It's now very similar. It, it, it goes in phase with the ionic current. So as the ions move slowly, we see that there's also an electronic current crossing the interfaces, uh, but it's much, much higher. So uh, we've multiplied the ionic current by 10 to the nine. Uh, and so the, the ionic current is 10 to the nine times smaller here on this diagram but the electronic current is moving in phase with it, with it. So what we observe is that the ionic current moving backwards and forwards appears to be modulating the recombination of electronic charges uh, at the interfaces. And if we, if we uh, compare the simulated impedance from, these, from using that drift diffusion model, we see that it looks very similar. Uh, to the experimental uh, observations. So what we have is an outer phase electronic current that's proportional to the ionic current. Okay, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump on so that we get straight to the circuit model stuff. Let's imagine that we evaluate, or let's, let's evaluate the voltage at this point in the circuit. If this interface is the, the key recombination point, let's now imagine we evaluate V1, let's call that interface one. And as we oscillate the voltage, we can determine the voltage there. And that's a fairly simple thing to determine because it's just a simple RC uh, time constant. So let's now just jump back to what would, that would look like in a band diagram, V1 is this interfacial point here. 
or in fact I'm simplifying and saying it's that point there but it's almost the it's almost the same but it depends on the details of the of the uh, exact um, energy level diagram. So now we apply our voltage V and what we observe is because the ions redistribute and if we've given them time to redistribute V1 is not changing as much as V. So we've applied an amount V but the amount of change at the interface is only half that amount because the bands are still flat. If the bands slope, if, if we applied and the bands slope downwards, then V1 would equal V, but here it doesn't. And what we now have is a description where we can describe the, we describe the transfer of charge across the interface by the, fra the, fra the fraction of um, electronic charge. So we're going back to the diode model, but we're changing the terms in it. So the fraction of charge that can go in this direction, electronic charge, is scaling by an amount V1. So the Boltzmann distribution is scaled by V1, but the amount that can jump back in that direction has also changed. In this case, it's got less by an amount V. So this is the amount that's got less, we applied V, but it's got slightly less, sorry, it's got, hasn't got less by an amount V, it's got less by an amount uh, V minus V1. So to get the signs right, we put V1 minus V there, representing the current going back across the interface. And the recombination current, instead of changing by V, is changed by V1. So if we know the R, if we know the RC circuit for our ions, and we know what voltage V we applied, we can then calculate V1 and sub it into this expression. And it turns out that that description is very analogous to a bipolar transistor. So in a bipolar transistor, it'll look something like this. How am I doing for time, um, Bruno? Uh, you have about 12 minutes left. I, th I think I've been about half an hour, or well, 20, maybe about half an hour, but I may be running a little late. But hopefully this is making sense. So if we look at a bipolar transistor, we have a current that flows through the resistor. And if, if the uh, quality of the transistor is very high, such that you get no leakage through the, through the base of the bipolar transistor, then we can, we can picture our transistor like this. We've got a fraction of electrons in the end material on either side that is exchanged across an energy barrier. And if we were to apply a voltage, that will change, I suppose, the, the overall gradient across the transistor, but we could modulate the height of the gate or the height of the barrier over which electrons need to flow. And so if, if VB were zero, then actually we'd have no net, we, we'd have very little change in the overall current through the device. If VB, our base voltage, were much larger, then that's going to reduce the barrier and you'll get a much higher current flow across the interface. So what we see is that our, our description of the current is rather akin to what we had on the previous slide. And so by analogy, we can, we can introduce the idea of the interface behaving like a transistor, where instead of, a, so we've replaced our diode with a transistor, where the, the height, effectively the height of the barrier, which controls the current across the interface, is simply controlled by the voltage induced by accumulation of, or change in the accumulation of ions at an interface. So here, this is our this is our picture now of uh, current transfer across the interfaces. So 
in this context, we can think of the current moving across the interface as a as a diode as a recombination current. So again, we if we know V1, we can plug it into our transistor equation, and it turns out that this second term is almost negligible. So we can we can more or less ignore it. And so we've got the we've got the current flowing across the interface here. So the, the cell current depends on V1, and we could differentiate that to get our conductance of the interface. And that's and the, the, the conductance or, of, of the interface is what we would call a transconductance in uh, transistor speak. And if we were to take the uh, if we were to take the uh, reciprocal of that, so we invert it. Um, we will get uh, we'll get the transconductance of the interface, and it turns out the transconductance is just or sorry the, the the impedance of the interface will then be given by the ratio of the vol the the voltage at the interface divided by the voltage applied across the whole device multiplied by that transconductance term, and the transconductance term is just proportional to the current flowing through the interface. Uh, scale, sorry, scaled by, scaled by an energy, a thermal energy term, Kb times T. So let's, let's come back to our, our simulations and our observations of the impedance. So, We've got um, we've, we've got our experimental measurements in dots here. We've got the points here simulated by drift diffusion equations. So a more complete device model. But if we just take our simple circuit model, it turns out we can fit quite nicely the whole lot just using this this comparatively simple circuit model. And there are a few more things we did to. Uh, Factor in the change in the in the uh, interfacial capacitances with bias voltage, because of course the space charge layers we expect to change according to something like a mop schottky analysis. So the more voltage you apply, the or the the the, the uh, width of the interfacial layers will will be expected to change with the approximately with the square root of the the voltage. Or oh, can't remember if it's the inverse of the square root anyway, let's not uh, dwell on that right now. Um, but if we, if we um, factor those in, we get a very nice description of the whole, broadly speaking, the whole behavior of the uh, system to a first approximation. And the five free parameters in this case are the capacitance of the interface um, and the eight, a, a parameter to, to describe the asymmetry between the capacitance of the two interfaces, the ionic resistance, the saturation current density of the, um, the uh, 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 and the saturation the saturation current density of the interface and the ideality factor of the interface. <coughs> Given those parameters, we, we we more or less describe the key behavior of our perovskite device. Okay, so so here we are. Here are those those parameters. In, in practice, to get a more uh, complete model, one might actually wish to split the interface and and calculate the voltage at the point right between the two uh, space charge layers. And you, of course, you could calculate a voltage at each interface. And again, that's relatively trivial, just using an RC circuit. And uh, what th this is really just an, an, a description of why we observe the ionic uh, to ionic to electronic amplification. If you recall, we saw that the electronic current uh, flows in proportion to the ionic current. And uh, a little mathematical analysis shows that the 
the outer phase component of the, the recombination of across the interface is going to go in, in proportion to the ionic current flowing across the interface at, at low frequencies. And that's because the, the, the ionic current is just dependent on the capacitors and the, such that the voltage changes in proportion to the ionic current. Okay, so what we have ultimately is something that explains the apparently very, very high capacitances. So the, the very, very high ca capacitances observed in, in, in these perovskite systems at low frequency are actually just a recombination current that is out of phase with the applied voltage. So we apply an oscillating voltage at low frequency and what we're, rather than seeing accumulating charge, we're just seeing a recombination that's occurring out of phase with the applied voltage. <coughs> so now let's just think about the transistor model in a more general sense. So if we take our, if we take our transistor model, we could actually describe it as with two transistors, or indeed more, as we'll see, um, we, could, we could have recombination, if we just consider electrons, we can have recombination of the electrons at one side and injection or collection of the, the uh, electrons at the other side. So we can, we can complicate our circuit model a little bit more. And um, in doing so, uh, we get, um, it, it, by by doing that, what 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 we get is a voltage between the between the two transistors, which is different from the voltage on either side of our circuit. And, in, and to find that voltage, we need to solve for Vn. And if the ideality factor is one on both sides, then there's an analytical solution. If not, we have to. Uh, if if the ideality factor is different for the two interfaces then we would have to uh, find a numerical solution. But if we take our, our circuit model and this transistor description, not only can we describe the small perturbation behavior, but we can do a good stab of, of describing the large perturbation behavior. So if we, if we sweep, do a linear sweep, depending on the scan rate, we can derive current voltage curves, either in the light or the dark, um, which, um, which, which more or less replicate the kind of behavior we'd expect to see from real devices. Not only that, the value of Vn that we find is then equivalent to the Fermi level of the electrons in the device. So we can, so in this, in this case, this is an experimental observation. If we take the same scan rate and, and the, uh, fitting parameters we determined from our impedance, we, we get a current voltage curve that looks very, very similar to what we've observed uh, experimentally. And we've also determined uh, the electronic Fermi level uh, in the device as we scan the voltage. And we, and we observed that it's not constant relative to the applied voltage V. So V is the applied voltage here in the forward, uh, let's see, in the, in the reverse sweep, and then going back uh, in the in the forward sweep. So we're going we're going like so in our in our sweep there, and we're looking at time on this axis. We can see how the various parameters change. And all we've done to solve this is just solve the simple RC circuit as a function of time. We haven't needed any any more complicated mathematics to do that. Once we do that, we've derived v1 and v2 with time. We plug those into the transistor equations to determine the electronic current. And we can also, we can also derive um, an arbitrary uh, generation or voltage versus time profile. So, right, so we're going back to this kind of a model, but instead of doing a sweep here, we're doing a voltage step. And we might see something like that, that looks something like this. Um, so we'd see an initial 
slow rise in current as uh, the ions re redistribute, preventing um, injection of charge from one side of the device, and then, then dies away as uh, the recombination at the other end interface varies with time. It's also possible to see um, negative capacitances or inductive behavior when one measures the impedance of these devices. And we have to introduce additional elements to our circuit model to describe that. But we think that they're potentially physically plausible elements. So here we've got the proverbial elephant. And of course, you can fit anything. You can even fit an elephant if you introduce enough. Uh, parameters into a circuit, and in this in this case, we described our re we described we chose to describe recombination being limited by at, at the electronic holes at the electronic interface, uh, the the ETM interface, and we also included the possibility that there could be some kind of chemical reaction at the surface, a chemical reaction or penetration of ions into the surface. And by doing that, we get an additional time constant in our circuit, and that can mod modulate the recombination at the interface such that it appears to show inductive behavior. But again, we're not looking at real induction, we're just looking at out of, um, out of phase recombination. And it's, depending on the phase direction, it either looks like it's inductive or capacitive. Yes, can I ask? Uh, how I think much? I'm, I'm, I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, what, what, what I've described, I hope, is a an intuitively, although it seems a bit daunting at first, once you get the hang of it, it's quite an intuitively simple circuit model that we think describes the, the key behavior of most um, perovskite devices. And uh, this, this, on, on the right here, I've just shown a, a uh, I've shown a general, a more general form of the model. So, and in fact, it could be generalized one step further. I'll just describe that. So we've got two processes at each interface. We've got uh, recombin in this case, recombination of electrons and injection of holes. And at the opposite interface, we've got the injection of electrons and the recombination of holes. And we could have a bulk recombination. Uh, we could put a diode in the middle to describe bulk recombination as well if we wanted in our circuit model. Although we think that that's generally a small comp contribution relative to interfacial processes. And then, but, and then in each case, uh, these recombination uh, rates or injection rates are going to be modulated by the voltage of the relevant barrier at each interface. Um, and so this framework for looking at, at the behavior of these devices gives what we think is a very nice way of understanding, um, understanding the behavior of perovskite devices and a route to start fitting impedance spectra. You have to write slightly more sophisticated uh, fitting routines than, than standard RC um, fitting routine, but nevertheless, you can get there. Uh, so with that, I'll finish up and hopefully there's a bit of time 